Okay, hey everyone, and welcome to today's video where I have a special guest, Otto Alchemy. And Otto Alchemy is a YouTuber that caught my eye in the last year uh, with some really fascinating videos. And what I see uh, with Otto Alchemy is he really tries to get that blend of deep Jungian interpretation. And also he has an interest, a similar shared interest with me in the cognitive type development. So. The context for this video is that I made a video where I argued that personality type to some degree might be able to change. And Auto Alchemy responded to this video, argued a little bit uh, in regards to this topic. And so what the, do you think that personality type can change? And if so, to what regard? Right. That's a great question. And I mean, I was drawn to the title of your video because that is something that has been on my mind a lot lately. I think I'm really in a headspace where I'm sort of wanting to challenge a lot of the dogmas that are floating around in the typology community. And, and so for me, I guess just starting broadly, I would say, I think to a degree, I do believe that type can change. Um, and it primarily changes through the development of function. So you become more well-rounded and less of a stereotype, less of a caricature. And I think that that is a thesis that's pretty supported in psychological types, for example. I've been reading through the book on my channel, uh, doing some commentary as I read. Yeah, basically the way uh, uh, I see it is when we were introduced to personality type and to the Myers-Briggs type indicator, the, one of the first things we're told is type cannot change, it is fixed. And beyond that, people tend to argue about the uh, personal types in a very caricature and stereotypical manner, which is that, you know, uh, you have the heartless, cold ESTJs that run over everyone's feelings and have no uh, personal integrity. And then you have the uh, deep and sensitive artists, INFPs that uh, have no capacity to uh, put themselves forward and uh, that will are doomed to never succeed in society because they lack the strengths to do so. And so you created these kind of uh, static differences and categories to make it easy for you to organize people, but you provided no solution, like no recipe for how people can develop or how they can change uh, through this formula. So uh, uh, cognitive personality type development has come to become one of my passions of this year and uh, one of the things that I have found myself really wanting to research and so my thoughts are like do you believe that it's possible to change your personality type through cognitive development? So uh, one area of definition that I want to get into is um, what do you mean by change your personality type because I believe that you can I believe that you can continue to transform and grow as a person and develop your capacities, but I'm not sure that I believe that you can become a different type because in my mind, being a type, being a particular type is sort of a, a starting point. And so as you grow from your particular starting point, you're like a tree. If you are an INFJ, um, early on in your development, you aren't going to be that different from, if you're a five-year-old INFJ, you're not going to be that different from the other five-year-old INFJ. But as you move through life and accumulate experiences and begin to develop your functions, then it creates these bifurcating branches and then flowering leaves. And through all of that, I feel that you become more and more of an individuated, unique person. But I don't think that you can ch chop down the trunk of the tree and like plant an INFP seed and grow from that. So I think you can become more well-rounded, more uh, distinct to the point that you might as well throw your type in the dustbin because now you are truly an individual. Right. Yeah. So the way I see it is, uh, and I'm starting to really approach personality type as a spectrum where I used to believe that, you know, the personality types represent fixed uh, parts of the brain that do certain activities and have mm -hmm. certain traits. Nowadays, I see them more as umbrella terms, similarly to how we talk about ADHD or autism in the psychological mm -hmm. community. Uh, I see personality type as an umbrella term and cognitive functions as an umbrella term. They're a language meant to approximate and explain uh, the individual but they are not meant to in themselves represent pure 100% processes. So to make it practical, if we take the argument of introverted intuition or extroverted intuition, we can see that there is a range here within these two functions and a degree of overlap here between these two processes in which they can really resemble each other's. And you can also say for the individual person, you might have uh, ENTPs 
uh, that are a little bit closer to the introverted intuitive angle, uh, who are more slow in their extroverted intuitive process and more deliberate, more goal oriented in how they apply their intuition uh, than the average ENTP might be. And in so they might be a little bit on the border between these two processes, mm -hmm. perhaps still within the extroverted intuitive language to a bigger extent, but um, yeah, what I'm saying at, what I'm gearing at is this idea of, uh, okay, we have ENTPs that are a little bit more towards introverted intuition, ENTPs that are a little bit more towards extroverted sensation, ENTPs that are a little bit more towards maybe extroverted thinking or extroverted feeling, uh, and um, where these functions start to kind of blend and mold together to some extent and um, have a degree of overlap. Yeah, I, I really like that idea of the continuum, and uh, it reminds me of uh, recently, I had not not too recently, but at some point in the last year, I had an argument with someone online um, over the definition of introverted thinking versus extroverted thinking. And so that argument kind of motivated me to jump into psychological types and see what Jung had to say about these two different functions and how we can think about them in relationship to one another. And it really is described as more of a continuum in the book where, or at least, from an outside observer, you can't always tell if what you're looking at is introverted thinking versus extroverted thinking. Um, the example that I give that kind of clarifies this is, you know, you might have someone who is an extroverted thinker who has just been living among a cloister of introverted thinkers. And because they're doing that extroverted process of honoring the spectrum and tracking what all of these introverted thinkers are thinking, they have internalized and learned have learned to speak a particular language that can look a lot like introverted thinking and that that influence kind of rubs off on them a little bit. So it is, it is deep, it's, it's difficult rather to, to pry open and understand what's going on beneath the surface. Yeah, uh, I'd like to go back a little bit to the beginning of the discussion as well in regards to cognitive development here, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, I think I'm on board with you that maybe when you're younger, uh, I think it's more easy to type a person than when you get older in life, especially if the person develops themselves, and uh, depending on how they develop themselves. Right. Uh, so what you might see is that uh, uh, in the beginning, it's easy to track a person is way more on one end than the other. Um, people tend to have more of a strong sense of internal conflict because uh, they tend to have some functions that they've come to specialize in and some functions that they've come to ignore throughout their development. But throughout life, when you're forced to assume adult responsibilities and uh, you're forced to learn things that you might uh, not enjoy to some degree, uh, you start kind of... Uh, uh, molding over to the other side more and more, and you start uh, becoming more rounded in your development. And it even goes that, you know, I've always argued that there are certain flow functions, saviors that you enjoy pursuing at the expense of others. But the more you develop something, the more you enjoy it. That's, a, that's an interesting observation. And I think this is all complicated too, by the fact that um, I mentioned this in a recent video, but the idea that if we were living 2000 years ago, provided we were like lucky enough to be, you know, a citizen and not some person on the, uh, on the outskirts. Um, if we were living thousands of years ago, life wasn't necessarily as complex. Like the world wasn't necessarily as complex as it is today. We are riding this wave of increasing complexity. And part of that entails having to learn to develop these other functions that maybe you wouldn't have had to learn if you were just a particular role in a particular tribe and you lived like a very predictable life from beginning to end and there was no like we live in a world of such insane unpredictability relative to some of our ancestors and so i think that that also changes the nature and the context of this conversation about type i think we're in a we're in a transitional phase where maybe it is worthwhile to start thinking about new ways of perceiving type beyond the static category yeah Sure, that makes sense to me. Yeah. I, I think um, another thing that I wanted to kind of bring up is uh, for my job, I work in online education and I end up seeing a lot of content from various schools. I used to work for a school of funeral services and I would occasionally, you know, crawl through their, their pages and check that the content was performing properly, et cetera, et cetera. But um, recently I ended up doing an inspection on a course about the neuroscience of personality and you know, we exist in this weird pop typology bubble, right? And it's worth questioning, how does that relate to the broader conversation and psychology about personality? And so I had never even known that 
um, as a basic definition of personality, typically uh, academic psychologists define personality as a triad consisting of your thoughts, your feelings, and your behavior. And in these semi pseudo Jungian circles, we don't really, we kind of dismiss behavior because we think about, you know, the functions as being more fundamental than that. But if you define personality as those three things, and it's kind of obvious that your personality changes over the course of your life. I'm sure that 10 years ago, Eric Thor had different thoughts running through his head than you do currently today and different feelings and different evaluations of things. Um, and you probably behave somewhat differently too. So that is a complication with thinking about this stuff. It's like, what are we actually talking about if we're not talking about thoughts, feelings, and behaviors? Yeah. And that's also, I think, is one reason why we tend to disagree so much on personality typings online and why there's such a conflict online, how to uh, take things. First of all, because there is this uh, overlap between functions. So sometimes, uh, for example, an ENTP might appear more like an ENTJ, or sometimes they might appear more like an INTP. And uh, people uh, draw the lines and boundaries differently. So the question is, where does the midpoint go? Like, when does an introvert become an extrovert based mm. on our experiences of them? Do we have influence uh, on uh, our personality type? And uh, can we put a number on it? Is it 50-50, the nature and nurture? Like, can we say that, yeah, to some extent, people can change within a type and uh, maybe even to a sibling type or a similar type and... Uh, uh, to, uh, or to, uh, how far does it go? What do you think? So uh, I guess my final position is that we can change our type in the sense that we are no longer committed to being a type, that we're not acting from a place of automatic preference. But uh, I, I guess I see it as like your type is a, a raft that you can use to get across a particular river. And that river is the early, early chapter of your life. And once you make it on the other side, you still have the skills that you acquired along the way, but you no longer need to be a particular type. You need to become more and more individuated. So, I mean, let's say 50-50. <laughs> let's take the safe, safe route. Yeah. I think uh, I'm not uh, ready to give a complete answer on this topic. Uh, we because need numbers. This isn't, yeah, it's an ongoing uh, uh, research project of mine mm -hmm. uh, to try to uh, figure out this equation. You know, the more I learn about cognitive development, the more fluid type seems to become. Yeah. Uh, because I used to operate with this 16 personality structure of, uh, you know, 16 uh, types that were within themselves all identical and stereotypical. But uh, now I see, okay, 16 types with four subtypes and uh, then different levels of development. And then, you know, mm -hmm. like, uh, so suddenly it becomes uh, a little bit more blurry and a little bit more complicated. Uh, but um, I'd say that if I'd give a number on it, I'd say that the... Uh, um, 50%, 40% uh, changeable. I'd say slightly, uh, uh, for most people, I think it will stay relatively to the same throughout your life, even if you'll change a lot within your type and you'll learn how to be that better. Uh, for some people who have experienced maybe larger extent trauma and difficult experiences, then it might be more malleable. And I think it might be especially more malleable early in life. Anyways, uh, once again, thank you so much for coming on this channel and uh, for everyone else, just don't forget to check out Otto Alchemy's channel down below. He's made some amazing rap songs on the personality types uh, and he's also currently doing a reading of Carl Jung's work. So if you want to learn more about Carl Jung's work, I definitely recommend checking that out. Thank you for having me, Eric. It was a great conversation.